can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for Poetry Against Tyranny, a reading and conversation with three Burmese poets. My name is Julie Story, and I'm the coordinator for programs, students, and outreach at the Harvard University Asia Center. This event is co-sponsored by the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute and by Aruna Global South, a nonprofit that serves to highlight and amplify experimental scholarship from scholars of marginalized backgrounds with interests in Asia and its diasporas. I would like to begin with a land and people acknowledgement. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. I would like to thank Courtney Whittakine, PhD candidate in social anthropology at Harvard and a contributing editor at T-Circle, which is an online forum for new and emerging perspectives on Myanmar during its current period of political and economic transition for introducing us to today's discussant, Chu Mei Peng. And also a huge thanks to Chu for introducing the Asia Center to today's poets and for her insight and creativity that helped to bring this event together. Before I introduce Chu, I would like to remind guests today that they can type questions into the Q&A box and Chu will select questions once the poets have finished their readings. Please be clear in your question about which speaker you're addressing or if your question is for all three poets. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's moderator and discussant. Born and raised in Yangon, Myanmar, Chu Mei Pang is a first-gen immigrant currently pursuing her PhD in cultural and linguistic anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. She is also the founder and director of Aruna Global South. Her academic writings have appeared in The New Ethnographer, American Ethnologist, and Society for Linguistic Anthropology, among others. When Chu is not doing research on signs, symbols, and images in Burmese political communication, she writes under the pen name of Machinte, Miss Lion. Her creative writing in Burmese has appeared in the Runa Glo Global South blog and is forthcoming in Jakarta Biennial. Please join me in welcoming Chu. All right. Um, well, thank you, Julie, for um, you know for your introduction and also for inviting me to introduce and engage in the conversation with the three Bami sports today. And thank you also to Harvard Asia Center and the Lakshmi Middle and Family South Asia Institute for co-hosting today's event with uh, Aruna. And as grad student, we stood in solidarity with the Harvard Student Union strike last October and postponed our reading. And now we're gathered here with our initial intention to commemorate the lives lost since the stage of the coup and before the coup in Myanmar. The timing of this event is also appropriate uh, in that we had just reached the one year anniversary of the coup uh, a few days ago. According to the Assistant uh, Association for the Political Prisoners, Bama, there are uh, 8,934 people arrested and then 1,510 people killed by the hunter as of February 2nd. In the case of people and social groups in Myanmar like Gayin and Rohingya, the state violence is not just one year old. And like people in the cities, they have been enduring mass killings and forced displacement even prior to the 2021. The coup and nationwide mass killings have just emphasized what has been happening in Myanmar. Time for people in Myanmar has been stagnant as if seconds no longer tick, minutes no longer move and hours no longer matter. We have been and still are in the continuous cycles of mourning for our loved ones, our heroes, and our dreams that have been forcefully taken away from us. Yet we remain hopeful. And I'm humbled to be in the company with the poets today and to join in this collective act of mourning and courageous act of hoping for new futures for all peoples of Myanmar. And thank you for being with us today. But first, I want to clarify a few things. Uh, by Bamis poetry, I mean the poetry uh, written in Bamis language and or by poets who identify themselves as Bamis. Uh, the term Bamis, especially after the coup, uh, has become so loaded that we need to be careful when, like, when we say 
uh, who and what we are referring to when we say Bamis. By no means this umbrella term Bamese poetry can represent the stage of poetry in other languages of Myanmar or by poets who may not necessarily consider themselves as Bamese, uh, despite being from Bama. So first I want to recognize that the contemporary poetry scene in Myanmar is a colorful and diverse terrain that we cannot afford to oversimplify or generalize, especially the prolific scene of Rohingya poetry is also worthy of noting here. And if you're interested, you can read a series of uh, Rohingya poems on this website, www.rohingyalanguage.com. And secondly, I want to pay homage to the poets who have paid for our aspire freedom with their lives this past year. The very first poets who were, ki were killed uh, were poet Go Chan Da Sui and poet Mami Min Zin in March of last year. Ko Chan Da Sui writes under the pen name of Ke Zha Wen, and he left Mong Hook to write poetry more than 12 years ago. And as a result, his poems critique not only the political life in Myanmar, but also the influence of Buddhism in everyday Burmese life. For example, his poem, Te No Peyang Amapu, or I Don't Worship Your God, sharply highlights the Buddhist undertones in Myanmar's political life. Some of his poems have been translated into English and published in the Megang Review. Poet Mami Min was a teacher. She had just posted her blood type on her social media before she was killed at a protest if anyone were to need blood transfusion. Since then, many more poets have been de detained, abused, and killed by the military in Myanmar. Poet Kati, who recited these lines at Koke Zawin's funeral was arrested and later passed away in the hands of the military in May, 2021. His organs were found to be removed from his body. In this past year, not only did we lose some of these poets to the hands of the military, but also to COVID due to the turbulent political situation in Myanmar, People, especially our elder populations and those with pre-existing conditions have succumbed to COVID. In August of 2021, a highly respected and influential Burmese poet, Aung Chaim was one of those. So I wanna take a few moments of pause and silence here to pay homage to these fallen poets and heroes and those who are still fighting in Myanmar. As I described earlier, poetry and poets in Myanmar have been deeply intertwined with the nation's turbulent politics, even before the coup uh, in February, 2021. During the pre-colonial era, there was a wide range of different poetry writing techniques, each for different purposes. I recall, for example, during my middle school and high school years in Myanmar, learning classical Burmese poetry written by uh, exiled courtiers like Myanmar Minji Usa, and classical Burmese poetry also depicts different Burmese ways of life. For example, a genre of Burmese classical poetry called Ain Jin is usually used and recited by the farm girls or Kao Sai Tama. And the topics and issues in Ain Jin usually depicts rural Burmese life. But during the colonial period, Burmese poetry continued to flourish. A group of writers and poets led a major literary movement called Kisan or Testing the Times during this period from 1920s to 1930s. Anti-British nationalist sentiments and the independence movement fueled the literary movement as well. <clears throat> Later in the post-independence era, Burmese literary scene, including poetry, faced a huge challenge of censorship. During the Nguyen era military regime, a various literary techniques like abstract writing became a way to circumvent the potential censorship of the press scrutiny board. This brief tracing of the Burmese literary world shows that it is inevitable that poetry and other literary genres in Myanmar have been integral, if not central, to politics. Even during the Aung San Suu Kyi era Myanmar, 
poets have used poetry as a tool to commentate on the unequal sociopolitical situations in modern day Myanmar. In 2016, for example, poet Mao Sang Ka was detained for writing a poem that claims he had tattooed former President Teng Seng's name on his penis. You can see Mao Sang Ka here. Also in 2019, during Myanmar the Jan or Water Festival in April, five Yen satirical poets were arrested under the Penal Code 505A, which persecutes statements including public mischief. Different from contemporary literary poetry, Bami satirical poetry or Tanjet is another genre that blends traditional folk songs, dance, and Bamese musical instruments like sign wine. It usually includes the call and response routine. In their New Year performance of Tanjet, the five poets, poets Ke Kain Tong, Zia Luing, Pai Piu Ming, Pai Ye Tu, and Zor Lin Tut of the Tanjet group Pico generation criticized the army's share of power in parliament and showed the audience pictures of a dog wearing a military jacket. They were later released. Today, there continues to be prolific Bamis writers and poets, not only within the country, but also in the diaspora, as you will see today with uh, our three poets. Poetry in the context of Myanmar politics is not only a social commentary, but also is somewhat prophesying. It is a tool to warn others, but also to impose a change in future. For example, after seeing military trucks in his neighborhood, Poet Zia Ling wrote a poem titled Portrait of a Historical Record at Dawn on January 29, 2021, just a few days before the military staged the coup. So now I want to share the video of Poet Zia Ling citing, reciting this poem published by Let Dong Zhang, Three Fingers on um, social media page. So let me go to that. Can you see? Is it good? Okay. More Zhao Yan, more Kuan the Kuye Bong Zhu. Then you are Lombe, Leji, Meji, Nizi Ni Yedui, Dom Shu, you are Chani Kene. Su do your, Ket do your, Yue do your, Wun do your, Le a Chaya, a ya, the Ku Long, Song Song Mu. When that Moose is in Lindema. ตันจักกากาตะซินหากูรู้ยะกวดเถอูจองจองเนี่ยสิทธิ์มาวนลาตะเอลีตีนขวยฉะตะกองลูนะคาวนโทปีโหชูดีเชเนี่ยเมลง
So the military coup has been a rupture. It's not only for the people of Myanmar to fight for our struggles against this recent coup, but also to rethink the ongoing and underlying inequalities among us even during the seemingly good times. And I've personally witnessed the proliferation of a new generation of artists, poets, writers, activists, and thinkers that are coming together not only to resist, resist the military, but also to reimagine new futures. As much as news have reported on the Gen Z participation in Myanmar's spring revolution in activism, I'm also seeing the Gen Zs are not shy of utilizing poetry as a tool of resistance either. So, for example, uh, poets like Forums on social media are also writing poetry to contribute to the resistance. Later, we'll hear more about three feature poets from this new generation as well. And because of them, I remain hopeful. To echo Bami's poet and activist uh, Ma'i's fearful, uh, fearful lines in her poem, Sorry, uh, this is the, the Gen Z poems that I was just mentioning. Uh, from Mei's uh, poem, A Letter for Lovers and Haters, I wish words for a world that is worth living in. And I'm honored to present the next generation of Bamese poets and activists in their own right and their works to you today. And due to the safety concern, uh, we, regret, we regret that we were not able to invite the poets who remain within Myanmar and continue fighting with their pens for our revolution. But the future poets today are eager to commemorate these Bamese poets and contribute to our fight for freedom with their work. And with that, I want to welcome the first poet, Edna Du or Itet. Edna Du Itet is a reader, writer, and community supporter. She was born and raised in Yangon, Myanmar, before moving to the U.S. They are currently located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Tungpa people, Los Angeles. She holds a B.A. in politics from Willamette University with a focus in international human rights and children in armed conflict. They also write under the pen name Away and has appeared on the Aruna Global South blog, and their commitments include transnational justice, mutual aid, and community, community building. And uh, I'm honored to present uh, Edna to you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, too, for the lovely introduction and for contextualizing um, the reading and everything going on. Um, I think it's um, important to acknowledge that even though we're talking about the military coup and um, everything that has come up after that, uh, much of our communities have been facing uh, this violence and injustice for much longer. Um, so yes, so um, thank you everyone for being here and engaging with us. It's so good to see you all, um, even though uh, I can't really see you all. So feel free to um, leave a message in the chat, uh, leave a comment, questions, anything. Um, it's so good to share this space with you all. Thank you uh, to Julie for organizing this and to Machu for uh, bringing us all together. Uh, Machu also helped me with my translations uh, for my readings. So thank you for that um, and all your support. Um, so in, um, before I begin, I just wanted to also note that it feels kind of weird um, and it's like a major privilege. Uh, for me to not only be able to write uh, and write whatever I want to, uh, but also to be able to read in such a public event uh, and maintain some semblance of safety um, while our people are still facing a lot of danger. Uh, and we wanted to just honor and acknowledge our comrades who are still in the country fighting, the artists and the poets who um, have paved the way and the, those who are, um, those who we have lost, uh, to the atrocious actions of the military. Um, so uh, to begin, I am actually going to uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, um, so in order to begin, I just wanted to read a poem by Kethi, who is one of the revolutionary poets uh, that Chu mentioned earlier, uh, who was murdered by the military. Um, and this poem in particular will only be read in Burmese. 
Uh, afterwards, I'm going to read a few of my own poems, uh, and those will be both in English and in Burmese. Um, I also wanted to give a special shout out to my friend Jessica, uh, who helps me with the poems and um, who is a supportive and great friend in general. Uh, she also hosts the most amazing BIPOC uh, reading series. Um, but thank you to all my friends and family and attendants today too. I'm grateful to have you all in my community. Um, and if you, uh, I'm also really excited to hear Mimi Ka and Mandy read their poems. So I'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, okay. So the first poem I'll be reading is Matanamatyakapu by Kepi, uh, who passed away in May of 2021. Um, okay, so that was the poem by Kepi. Um, and this one is, this one I'm going to read is called Superstition. Um, and it's about how people are superstitious, I guess. Um, okay, superstitious. I'm too scared to oppose superstition. Throw salt over my left shoulder. Throw away, throw away nail clippings outside. Don't walk under ladders. Don't let books hit the ground. Avoid opening umbrellas and doors. Avoid whistling at night. Knock on wood until my knuckles give out. They say that if you laugh too much, you might be crying soon. I save my joy, wrap it in foil, place it in the freezer. Can't risk the universe giving us a reason to cry. All that and still cursed. Can you even curse an entire country? Is it luck, karma, or simply a curse? To scare us, to spare us, kill us, does the curse feed on our fear, our dread, our lives, when they drag spirits out of this realm, blood soaked into the soil, too many lives taken, already no? Curse or not, even after we banish them, exercise them, from our wombs, from ourselves, something strange lingers in us. If they cast their curse, I can cast mine, stick needles in a candle, recite the chant three times, light every match I can find until my lungs fill with smoke, if the coup is a curse, the revolution, it's yet yeah. Break the curse, break the cycle, break us all free, but I don't discount their cruelty. As a curse or as luck or as karma, no yet yeah. but we have each other and our revelation, a revolution, we will free us all. Um, Sao beba bakomo pia. La tenga pia ma ipia twa pia. Lega au pia ma shao sa o mi ma ti ain do ain ma ti ma poya. Nya a chen le ma chon le se tu yang ya na ti ta tao dao dao ka. Ye ya long ya ngwa re lu pyo ja ma pia ti ba o. Shi ya pyo shen mu o ke sa ku na ti cha tou yi ge ta da ye tin ta. Ma sun sa ye u. Do ga ji tin ye ngu zi ya jang la bi ma su lu. A long lai na do le jin sa mi ni se. Nai ngan ta ngai ngan long u jin sa ka lu ya lu la. กุดูกันล่ะเวจุยล่ะจิงซาเวล่ะชาวผู้ชาวในหมู่ตาผู้จิงซาสุราเซลจิงเซนัยอ๋อมาเรียกเจ้าหลานเจียงยูนวันเจ
Um, the next one um, I'm going to read is called Substitution. Um, this came more from a longing from home and I'm trying to find things um, to sub substitute. Um, but anyways, Substitution. When I ran out of Yadapu, I used a hing, get pancot pans from the Vietnamese market to make mulemeya. I used to work at my school cafeteria, told one of the cooks that his cooking transports me to my grandma's kitchen, a confession of sorts, even every time after he cooked, he would hide like two quarts of his spicy roasted pork for me to quickly shovel in while I take my 15 minute breaks when I ask my mom she makes of measurements when I make familiar foods they aren't familiar. I am not great at substitutions, chasing approximations of my memories, attempting recreations for every detail I can grasp of home. Each, each synonym brings me further from the truth. No more obvious connections is home a ruse, but home is still here or home is still there, but home is also here. Like the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas, a multiverse with a portal, atoms get scrambled, lose details, a gamble to remain whole, atoms get rearranged with each passing through a strange, never return to where they belonged, never know where we can belong. Sometimes I come to face that ret to return to home is not always a place. I can make ono kaosue only as well as I can bake a casserole, both are just so-so. Now I sleep talk in both tongues, but in writing, I still misspell things in both. Clung to all my 14 of my plants, all met their demise. I can't keep alive, but now I keep a fake plant by my side. When I look, I can almost feel the sunrise and home. I can grow beautiful things far away and still tend to beautiful things back home. ยาตาบุกเกาะเนี่ยตะหินตุ๊เนี่ยมุลเมียซาจินอวีเอ็นไอซายานิปันคอตเดตเปอูลีตัวเวกอลเลยเอ็ดเมซาซองมาอะโล
the soft grit a reminder of what we once had, each home lovingly built and reluctantly left behind, reluctantly built and hastily escaped, hastily built and unwittingly abandoned, generational nothing, can ancestors haunt those who don't know the truth? I don't believe in ghosts, but every day is a haunting. Um, ไม่ยอมเลยเยอะชื่อเลยสุดาเลยอะไรอะเวนี่เลยชื่อเอเดมุเอเดจีเอเดอเมียมาคันจะซิงซิงจีตัวเมียที่เมียไปเข้าไป
ခမောင်မောင်ဖောတူတူချွေတတိတိမိချင်ငယ်ရဆောင်းစင်နဲ့ကိုယူဝတ်ချက်တိပြောနာမချင်ရအတက်အောင်မိုချင်းနောက်မ
အမှောင်တိန်တိုက်တွေရုတ်တရက်လေလွင့်လာကြတဲ့တန်သွားတဲ့ရေဒီယိုလိုင်းတွေအေရိုးဘစ်အကအဝါယောင်တဘုတ်
about the woman in the in the spring revolution. So there are different images of women leading the revolution that has come out of uh, the resistance. And this is sort of a snapshot of all of these women. And um, so I will, um, ha I have a slide uh, where I show sort of the, the actual picture that where I got the inspiration of this poem from, and I'll read it in, um, in Burmese and then in English. So uh, I'm going to share the slides. So Sarong Revolution is Sarong is like something the Burmese woman wear, um, and they um, it's also um, kind of a, a, a resistant against sort of the patriarchal norms. Uh, so these are the pictures that uh, I drew the inspiration for uh, this poem. It is called uh, the Sarong Revolution. Tame elan tuwe. Lene nyago go lene go te. Say ya tago, tame elan to be, linga di bata kulongo, do tap say it, nwe u dona ye da uga, napia, di da de we re. A temon de banha, lana ga a dam padrigo. Just give me one second. My found, my Burmese found is kind of here. Okay. Tame elan to we. Lena Nyago, Gola Neko Dan. Say ya tago, to me a land to be, Linga di Bata Kulongo, do tout say that. Nue u dollar eight da uga, Napia, Dida de Widri. A ten mound of Benha, Lanaka at Dan Padrigo, Nam ya in heel dinet, Sapim pin yota map mure, the Naka, but Guadazi reha, Matea, five I did lapawago, a yo dazon, a bion rene, a can look. Naro Aloha, Moya at Chimbang Richete. Then a piango ye ye tibi Mita Diane, Tau Chalite, do a song, do a song, ha. The year was a moonet, thirty etta, the dine the coolo, mo to get it. Mitina, Baho Zagani, Gabasa me and Narigo, Tsunami, Nelly in the coolo, Line Tat, Loka and Ware. Naro Aloha, Sister and Rosa Richete. Tamindai need the loans way, the nay long mat, the nay sayade, machine met, she met, Laza Lirigo, ye ye doubt some look, not to mat, nay yo, the gown tet nit, not omala, ana shingo, she zong at twat dolene, Naro alonha, naza, a loaf the mari pite. Thans along the long wood, la mount yoke with it, will loan it aya by a tea, met the yamugo, a part took it. Shinai, Dora near Yuriha, Anna, Pisa, Mukbong Yate a pit, the Zay Donglo, Yak Nakere, Naro Aloha, Dambong D, and D. G. Ripete. Sanre Pew, Dwari Jule, Saga Manu, Drizzle Danry, Argon Chit Oye, the base sit down, she's on money, Taming Dodo, Mam Baba, Chitate, Naro Aloha, La Thong Town Town, a poa o Ripete. One name a lue tire de rio, one name lue mui tire go yen de rio, to me a one at twenty, to dada me rebamaja. The tuire to tare. A mass chicono set touch chicono set to quaja de re, in the gago. Point hat jozo ya de re, in via malana in hore de reza, naro aloha, azani, me can reach it. Along a same big arm, Mama, so red, Mendeley, she rang up, Sako Nick Setuji. Our menry, a madrine, a paid a cook, the meat a cool jagger. Mado Mita diariha, the nine and long yet, now see with it, cheese and low, pick quin rare, Nado aloha, three lint rare, cheese and repite. Nado aloha, your assat take a song, young zone to main rene. A got me marry today. Lena Nyago, go lend a good day, say ya tago, to me a land to be. Anna, you a jump at the marigo, don't look do top say ya mate, no uta uga, napia, dida de we re. I will now read the translation. Surround revolution. Breaking the divine bound, divine bow with their own hands. Raising sarong flax on their chariot, they bring the entire lanker to knees at the front line of the spring revolution stood the Sita goddesses. 
With a tray of pickled fruits, she dared to stare the armed terrorists with fish sauce and hot chili flakes, beating the mixture well for the spice to soak in. Thick layer of the nakas on her cheek defined the palm of the police who strike her face unjustly. Smiling a big smile so genuinely, she defined the, she defined the injustice. We all manifest in ourselves the Moira's pick of fruits lady. Fearlessly locking her eyes with the rifle pointed at her, the knees that fell with loving kindness rose as a tower that divides between courage and cruelty, sending across a tsunami earthquakes from Eugenia epicenter to the headlines of the world, we all manifest in ourselves, Sister and Rosa. With tiffin boxes in hands, working for a day's wages to eat a day's meal, they bravely give, give up the monthly wages they barely have in hand. Might as well serve, starve, no night cook deeper than midnight. Revolting the tyranny from the front line, we all manifest in ourselves fearless garment workers. Banging pots and pan with a long bamboo stick with the strength that could break arms apart every eight o'clock and rage tears to exorcise evil are now the symbol of defiance against tyranny. We all manifest in ourselves the NDs banging pots and pans. White hair, teeth broken, but the courage not yet withered, shouting slogans from the top of their lungs, wearing their surrounds tight and short, marching from the very front with resolve and resolute. We are all grandma's three fingers race. Child carry in the in the womb, child born out of her womb, child born from a stranger's womb. She worries for them all as if they are of the same flesh and blood. The youth paying homemates before leaving home, those who need temporary homes, and those who will never return home. She welcomes them all. We all we are all martyrs, mothers. Everything will be okay. The Mandalay frontline hero assure all of us the love between father and daughter, a story full of dreams and daring sent a bullet through the neck of the entire nation. We are all fallen stars, Matezin. Wearing colorful tamings and different favorites, we are all phenomenal women at the front line of winning this revolution, breaking the divide bow with our own hands, raising surround flag from our chariots. We will bring the entire terrorist council to knee at the front line of the spring revolution. We will, stood, we will stand as cedar goddesses. Thank you. Um, I will end the slideshow. Um, so this is the, I'm going to read my last poem. I hope I still have some time. Um, this poem is, uh, I just recently written. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already heard it. Uh, Hot me we, uh, at a rally, uh, there's a video of it. Um, it is a gazelle um, and it's called, uh, and excuse my language, it's, it's, it's called Me'ilo um, Online in Burmese and Fakmel in English and just to give um, a little bit of background, um, I was I was sent the title um, in in the chat so that you can all see. Um, so M A L, uh, the word M A L is uh, as a nickname to describe the the cult leader Mian Lai. So the name Mian Lai, uh, it has, a, if you shorten it down in Burmese, it's Ma Ala, which is also an abbreviation for the word motherfucker in, in, in Burmese. And, and here, excuse my language. Um, but this is kind of a, this is kind of show you how much the people dislike the military. This is, this is how much people do not want him to be in power. So I think um, doing that is, is, is really, um, I think it shows like the anger and, you know, um, the experience that people have with um, this group leader. And I think it is really important as a poet to kind of convey this message. So I use this 
um, in my poem. And I, I, there's a reason I chose this as a Gaza as well. And, and a Gaza is a type of poem where you repeat the, the um, a phrase like at the end of every um, coup lesson, you know, at the kind of every uh, stanza. And the repetition is to sort of remind you of um, how prevalent this outrage and anger is. And I hope you kind of feed this in the poem as well. Uh, I'm going to read this actually in English first because I think the Burmese one is really stronger and I really want to end it with uh, the Burmese. Um, so here it goes. Fuck Mel. In today's descent, can a gazelle be sung to say fuck Mel? Belated curses, blasting bombs, pots and pans, all pray fuck mail. Tongue spring, will win in search for new vulgar rhymes, with unquenching thirst to curse again today, fuck mail. Tonight, a child died and a mother weeps by the candle light. At dawn, a father was returned, dead, decay, fuck mail. When they burn the poets alive, does the smoke rise to choke God from lungs to throat to put him in divine dismay? Fuck Mel. An old friend changed into camouflage, and when he saw his lover dismember, he clenched his fist. They will repay. Fuck Mel. Soldiers mock the air with blood smells, busted brains, and boots. Order to sidestep the poster that display fuck mail. In a ghost city empty somewhere, a dancer spins in neon yellow, a peel red nun gone round in this ballet fuck mail. The war is over, a flea market sprouts in a renewed era. People greet morning blessing to each other. Hey, fuck mail. Next is Bamani. A peacock spreads its wing in the Pacific towards the crowd through a megaphone. I read to the bay, fuck mail, October 23, 2021. So it's been a while. Now I'll read in Burmese. Ma'e lo meang lai. Digane dolan mu apie gaze de boko akulo di jume. Ma'e lo meang lai. A chain lin jing zare. ละเปียบงปอกเวมุเรญาสินตันบงตีตันเรอาลงมิตตาปุจะมะเอโลเมียงไลติติกวกวเซยีตั้นทวาวุชาบยาหาลิกายันเรโกลีวุยโลตะบ
And uh, now I want to welcome our last uh, poet, Mandy Mopointu. Mandy is a writer and a poet from Yangon, Myanmar. And her work has appeared in Longleaf Review, Tint Journal, Bar Happened, Meg, and elsewhere. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English from the University of the South, and she is an MFA candidate at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She is also a Thomas J. Watson Fellow. And at 21, she co-founded the Young Girl Literary Magazine, providing a platform for young and emerging Burmese writers to showcase their work. And her debut poetry chapbook, Monson Daughter, is forthcoming from 30 West Publishing House in May 2022. So welcome, Mandy. Thank you, Chu, and thank you to all Mimi and Edna and Julie. Uh, thank you for letting me be in community with you all, and thank you for your poems. I said in chat, I'm fired up, and <laughs> hopefully this will carry through to my reading. Um, I will be reading in English because my Burmese fluency is terrible, and I would not want to subject that to you. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem by Ma'i, and then I'll go into the ones that I've written. This one is called Weather Forecast. In the year after Lent intercalated, mid-monsoon will be good. Sparrows build their nests a little early. Early monsoon will be good. But out in bloom from parted branches, late monsoon will be bad. Tamarind leaves sprout late. Early monsoon will be bad. The chameleon's head is green. Early monsoon will be good. Crows build their nests a little late. Early monsoon will be bad. Euphorbias do not fruit. Early monsoon will be bad. Utea trees flower from upper branches. Late monsoon will be good. The kach doesn't yield much latex from the first tap. Early monsoon will be bad. Because I was at a meditation center for seven days, early monsoon will be good. Because I didn't achieve enlightenment there, mid monsoon will be good. Because I managed to return home in time, late monsoon will be good. Because I write poems, early monsoon will be good. Mid monsoon will be bad, late monsoon will be good. Because I write stories, early monsoon will be good. Mid monsoon and late monsoon will be good. Because I don't write stories, early monsoon, mid monsoon and late monsoon will be bad. The sun will shine for the next two days. It was cloudy yesterday. A storm will arrive tomorrow. In Yangon and its surrounds, the weather will be bearable. So that's from Bones Will Crow. So, all right. Um, a lot of my poems are going to be fairly short, so we're just gonna get right to it. Um, and let me share screen. So before I start, I'm not necessarily a fan of disclaimers, uh, but I do want to state that all of these poems are born from my own specificity as someone who was born and raised in Yango, Myanmar for at least half of my life. And then I've been abroad for about the other half. So a lot of this is, I'm very aware of my position in as someone who is at a distance from the home country and writing from that distance and from that position. Um, and so this first poem I wrote last year, shortly after the coup, um, when I was in Sawani. So if anyone knows Sawani, there's a lot of specific floral <laughs> references in this one, but we're gonna go ahead. On being absent for the revolution, spring revolution back home and I'm here, wrapped up and wilting in fading daffodils, twilight tripping and trillium tide. Back home, the padao is blooming, her golden tresses, the kind of wealth that hope affords. Even this tree is useful. But I am here, nestled nicely in Narcissus, rippled with red buds, shaking cherry blossoms from their boughs. Back home, blood is water spilled from flesh. Flowers bloom in the wake of the dead, but will they wake? But I wake, I wake here. Spring outside my window, winter boughs sprouting green. These balding cypress knees are nothing compared to the knees of my people, their bodies thudding with the glint and sear of metal through their heads, hail the victorious dead and sand the roads. 
Let the blood lead a little ways and then nowhere. See, these roads can lead, oh, nowhere. The way home is closed, but spring is here on this unsalted earth, on this daisy dotted grass where dandelions still hold wishes for puckered lips. No gunshots in the night here, no shards of glass on my bedroom floor. No thunder of pots and pans in the dead of night. My skin is clean, unstitched, my conscience tainted, not my body. My scars, my own, no scars for home. My mother knows where I am. I am not with her. I am here. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is called Facebook Messages to Our Mothers, the Night of the Military Coup. And I say night because it was the night of January 31st in the United States when that's happened. Are you okay? The world turns slowly. Here are the stars, there are the falling. I'm still awake. Are you? Waking, you will know. Waking, we. Are you safe? You're at market. Wet fish on metal trays, dead eyes watching. Cabbages as green as military coats. What do you need today? I love you. I'm not there who always said home is the ground you kiss. I want to be home, want home, I love you. Home is waiting for the rain on the swing of the veranda, a different kind of thunder now. I love you, pick up, I love you, pick up, I love you, pick up, and yet the same. Here we go again and again and again, when can we stop going? No matter what happens, I will keep fighting. And what can I do from oceans away? What can I offer who only paints with metaphors? I love you enough to bleed, enough to die. Okay, deep breaths, everyone. <laughs> um, so this next one, a little more imaginative. Um, the Buddha tries to withdraw money during the revolution. They're bowing. Wrinkled foreheads touching gravel, cracked palms tugging at Spider-Man t-shirts. But even the children know it's him. It's the light. Less the neon twinkle light spiraling at the Schwedegon, calmer, lighter. He gets in line behind a woman in a tattered to mane. She turns, presses her palms together, wishes she had a lotus. It's sandpaper stem, paper petals. Wants it for the significance of his birth, of his life. Instead, she stares, her eyes begging to speak, speaking without saying, Pia, why are you here? Almost, almost an answer. Nirvana is only bearable in a hopeful world. My mother sent me here, he says, to see. He means to breathe the silted air, stale with salt and sweat. Desperation is a specific reek, the ground fraught with it, at fault with it. The sun batters browning backs, the ones who still believe in waiting your turn. He wants to say karma is an excuse for the dung beetle, the stray dog, the military general. It's not for a country. The gravel pierces his heel. The mud sticks to his skin. Sweat setters through the saffron. He wants to speak, but the words won't come. Wants to pray, but God to whom? All right, moving on to the next section, we are going to, this, the next three at least are poems I've written kind of in response to the inaction of the United Nations on what is happening in Myanmar. And yeah, so for about two days, a couple of months ago, I was sort of possessed by this, let's say poetic muse spirit. Um, and I wrote a lot of UN poems within the space of two days. And this one is called Revolutionary Sestina. I will let that speak for itself. The epigraph is how many dead bodies needed for the UN to take action. It's a sign seen in front of the office of the United Nations in Yango. The UN. Dear Mimar, our current focus is on data collection. We understand you are undergoing a revolution. Enclosed within, you will find a condemnation. We are deeply disturbed by the killings. We are inviting dialogue. There are several methods of coping with military violence. There are more productive ways to process your grief. Dear UN, do you hear our pots and pans? Our grief is rusting metal thundering through the city. Data collection will not count the leaves of our youth sacrificed to military violence. We have a name. We are calling this the spring revolution. 
Watch us burn like the new wine in bloom. We cannot dialogue. Please help us. We need much more than your condemnation. Dear Myanmar, we've issued another condemnation. We understand and validate your national grief, but it's been months. Could we revisit the option of dialogue? Our experts are still working on their data collection. Please desist. The riots in the streets this revolution will yield few results against the onslaught of military violence. Dear UN, what do you know of military violence? Your wasting words, condemnation after condemnation, has no effect on the Demodol. Only this revolution, the civil disobedience movement. How can you know our grief? Our mothers wait by rusting gates. Put that in your data collection. Are you willing to commune with our dead to dialogue? Yamar, obviously we cannot invite your dead to dialogue. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> We've struck a nerve. Years and years of military violence have skewed your senses. This work, this data collection is important. Without it, we cannot offer condemnation. Don't look at us like that. Don't give us grief for a problem we didn't create. This is your revolution. UN, do you know how many of us have died for this revolution? Count those in 88, in 2007, in 2021. No chance of dialogue with the men who made our grandparents cry. Grief is a bullet in the hearts of the living. Military violence is more than a phrase, deserves more than a condemnation. Fuck you, fuck you and your data collection. Outside the UN office, a boy takes a stand against military violence. He hears dialogue, wonders about condemnation. He weeps his grief, how many dead? Too many for data collection. All right, um, this one is... Ruta is still Secretary General of the United Nations for February 2021. Someone tells him, an aide, early evening in Geneva, the stars on the cusp are falling. The words he spent years praying not to hear a military coup, Myanmar. No space to crumble, nowhere to fold into himself an origami lotus crushed in a cracking palm. Put it on the agenda, he says, his voice steady. He breaks down later, phone call to his mother, his aunt, his nephew. Don't worry, he says, wants to believe it. I'll protect you, he says, wants to believe it. I'll arrange for passports, I'll get you out. You can live with me here, wishes. He'd arranged for it all earlier. Oh, there was always time before, time in the between, in the after. He hangs up, tries to cry, drafts up a statement, wants to cover his ears with cloth, considers the sentence. UN Secretary General Uthan strongly condemns the violence his countrymen is inflicting on his countrymen. Uthan is appalled by the actions his countrymen are taking against his countrymen. Uthan calls for democracy, asks the military generals he knows by name to step down. In another life, his express wish is honored. Bury me in Myanmar, bury me at home. A man who threads the borders of the world, what a thing for him to ask. Bury me in my corner of the universe where the put out braids fall. Another time, his body carried by students in enamel white and beetle leaf green down the streets of Yangon. They're coming heralded by gunshots, their bodies joining his in gravel graves. Doomed to be a politicized body, to be a site for revolutions. Uthan wishes this revolution had come after his time. He takes the rostrum, needs a minute, holds the gaze of the representative from Myanmar, Burmese rep, Burmese secretary general, separated by glass. Uthan raises three fingers. The action For a moment, the glass shatters. Okay, um, as you can see, I was very mad <laughs> at the United Nations, um, and so, there's a lot of poems that was spawned. Um, I'll do this one, and I think this one's the last in the UN cycle, and then I'll do maybe about two more, and then we can get into the Q&A section. So this one is the UN as a divorce lawyer. He thinks it's easy, dividing up our assets, draw a line through everything you own, cities, townships, pagodas, give half, take half, say nothing about the leaving. He stares you down, adjusts his charcoal suit, his scarlet silk tie, worth more than your inflated economy. Be economical, he says, with your possessions, with your truths, with your lives. Ask your husband with the rotting teeth where the money is. The family funds you were supposed to keep for the kids. Ask him, know the answer, ask anyway. 
The lawyer crystal cut eyes, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Your husband, cheroot green sleeves, eaten, 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 my belly's full, quit your belly aching, haven't I given you enough? Who steps in, Mr. Nation's fingers poised for chiding, now, now. Twiddling thumbs, flexing indexes, you promise to try. So let's talk townships. Name your favorites. I'll negotiate a house, a flat, a bungalow. Home is a prayer with broken feet. Can you promise they won't burn like the rest of the city? A pen pouring ink, jade paper pillaged from the mountain village. Be economical. All's fair in love and war and military states. Sign here, ma'am. Sign your hopes away. You won't regret it. Okay, um, so I wrote a duplex. So I'll do this duplex and I'll do um, two usinos, which is a, it's a form. I will talk about it in a minute, but the duplex is a kind of a mesh between the sonnet and the guzzle. It was created by Jericho Brown. Um, and this is one of those that I wrote. Sunflowers last forever, or so we think. Farmers in Bagol are planting sunflowers under threat. How might you eat sunflowers? Hungry mouths do not care for everlasting. Nejaba, omen for the everlasting. Yellow thread stuck in Mayan Lai's teeth appear on Longji's white as Mayan Lai's teeth. My mother cracks open sunflower seeds, says nothing of their lasting. Nejaba seeds doff their black and beige coats, a full body pile. Flesh and blood bodies make a full body pile. If we had pinned sunflowers to their hearts, they would still die from bullets to the heart. Sunflowers last forever, or so you think. So um, the yuzana is a form that I had to create in one of my grad poetry workshops. So um, people in my cohort, you will know this one. Um, but it's a combination of the Burmese poetic forms of Dambao and the Yadu. So it's five stanzas, three lines each, and it has a little bit of a zigzaggy rhyme scheme. Um, I think it works best when you hear it, so we're gonna do this. Use now for the left behind. Sunflowers last forever. North, the farmers sow yellow seeds. In Bago, the sun rises under threat. Gunshots ring out, the air hot and veiled, the summer stale with sweat, salt, with salt. The leavers at fault, at risk, the left behind sister, she is lonely, is harried. They could have carried the girl across now, the world over, fed her clover to live. How do you forgive? The sun is still bright, still as yellow. She'll grow, she'll know better. And this will be my last one. Uh, this also a Yuzana. It should have been in the UN cycle, but um, it is what it is. If I hear the phrase deeply concerned one more time, I will shatter every bone, pull out the stones of my teeth in my sleep. I will crawl, red earth, brawl in the old woods where ogres stood for vengeance. In a sentence, I stave off guilt and gore and fire. Crush desire in my throat, each word they wrote I'll burn. Fuck concern, fuck the watching. Death is scorching, try it here. Take this fear, spit it out, refuse the drought. Wrench it all, action, stall. The wounds run deep, hearts in heaps, begging home. Thank you, I will cease here. Stop sharing. Wow, again, uh, thank you, Mandy, also for sharing your poetry. This is, yeah, really, really powerful. And I'm so glad to be in the space, even if it's virtual, <laughs> you know, with all three of you today. Um, so again, to the audience, if you have any question, either specific to the specific board or in general, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A uh, box. But I'll open up with the general question to all three of the poet, um, you know, just to kind of, starts us off on. Um, so uh, as I also kind of mentioned in the introduction, right? So, but for all three of you as poets, uh, what does it mean to you, uh, this relationship between poetry and politics in Myanmar, as most of you have also recited in your poems? 
any anyone can yeah start and feel free to chime in. Um, oh, you can go first. Oh, um. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just go really quick um, because I'm pretty new to poetry, both to reading and writing poetry. Um, but to me, poetry has always been political and always, I, I feel like poetry has always been rad radical in my head um, since um, like, it's, I feel like poetry and art as inherently radical and revolutionary um, because it is so accessible or like we can't make it accessible. I think um, <laughs> there, I won't say it is accessible, but we can make it accessible. There's um, freedom in writing, there's freedom in poetry. Um, it's a space for us to come together, um, to engage with each other. So that's how I see it. And um, poetry as also like community building uh, we share all these intimate feelings and intimate details with each other as we share our poetry. Um, and that builds community and relationships and in organizing that's so important. And um, yeah, yeah, I think, oh, also I, I just reread um, Audre Lorde's uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury. And I think that is just like, I don't know. I think when I read that, it really clicked in my head the importance of poetry and how like, radical really poetry is and can be. Um, and she describes this as like a distillation of experience, like um, when we, like everything's just floating around like dreams and concepts. And then as we write poetry, we engage with poetry and it turns into like concepts and then it turns into ideas, into knowledge production, and then finally to understanding. Um, and that is like, pretty cool, you know, so. I can chime in next. I think for me, um, I started writing before I came to the US. Um, and so I had like a community and group of friends who I used to write with back home. And being here, uh, when I, after I came to the US, uh, being here surrounded by, you know, um, there's not a lot of spaces for me to express um, in, in Burmese poetry. Um, and especially because I did my undergrad in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. So there was literally, I was the only Burmese person and within how many miles radius, you know? And so, so being able to write, especially me writing uh, online and then sharing that online, I was able to get in touch with, uh, keep in touch with the community back home, like other poets who, keep writing and be able to engage in that conversation. And even though it's not as, I mean, being away is really hard for me to, to, to do that and to engage in these conversations from online because I'm not there. I'm not in tea shops, you know, talking about poetry with my friends, uh, but at least it's would stay something that I, I kept um, throughout uh, so that, you know, like something to kind of mitigate like, whether me being homesick um, and things like that. And after, you know, uh, after the coup, especially, um, it was something for me to sort of process what had happened and like kind of process in my, my feelings and uh, sort of the future and, and, you know, the position that I'm in because, um, you know, when it was happening, I was not there, I was not along with a lot of my friends and like some of the poets uh, that I used to write with, you know, they were some of them who got arrested and, and things like that. Um, so, so then that becomes sort of just my way of exploring that guilt, um, the anger that I felt while at the same time not having the experience and enough of uh, what was happening back home. So that's kind of where it is and I think, Obviously, poetry plays like a huge role in, especially in the revolution. It's also some of a, a way to take part in, in that conversation of resistance as well, I think. Yeah, I think I'll add just a little bit more. Um, I think for me, writing has always kind of been, I I mean, I also wrote before I left for the United, for the, well, for Australia first and then for the US now. Um, and for me, in part, poetry has always been kind of a mechanism for survival because I think growing up, I never really felt like I had as much of a voice 
So writing helped me sort of acquire that voice. And I think in terms now that like years later from when I was 14 or so, um, it's a way to add a voice to the conversation and to add a voice to the cause and also to bear witness, especially because we are so far away from what is actually from the country itself. So um, in part, I think poets, and for me personally, I think there's a sense of responsibility there too, to sort of chronicle what is happening um, from where we stand. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for your very, uh, I think, thoughtful answer. And, you know, even though I don't identify myself as a poet, uh, I do, I do share the sentiment of, you know, being away from home and be able to participate, right? So um, I'll just kind of go alter, alternate between my, my questions and, you know, the audience questions. So please feel free to put them in the chat or in Q, uh, Q&A box. So there is a question in the chat for Mandy specifically. So I'll just read it out. Um, Mandy, your poetry is the most open angry. Do you think the fact that you have been away for long, longer makes you better able to express that anger? That's an interesting an interesting question for Mandy. Yes. I think definitely yes. I think it's anger um, as in poetry that is sort of looking outward and like being able to direct it especially to you know just this global organization like the United Nations was very productive for me and I think it's also kind of anger at myself, right? So there's the anger that I'm, it's just, there's just anger generally that's coming directed, I'm directing at myself, but I'm also directing it outward at organizations that can do a whole lot more than what I can personally do as one person. Um, but yes, and so being away and my, my relationship with Burma is complicated, my, language fluency plays a lot in that role too and but you know when the who happened all I wanted to do was be home and to be there on the streets um, with everyone so and part of being unable to do that and like Mimi I was in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee like the only Burmese student for miles around so it was that that isolation and that anger all of that um, ended up being channeled in poetry, which was something that I use as a form of just processing for myself, but also I think because it has brought me community when I needed it most, I wanted to do that. So I do think, yeah, I, so the answer is yes. I do think that being away has helped inform the anger and the poetry that follows. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. I think I think it reminds me of the the Audre Lords, the uses of anger, right? The essay. I mean, most of you have probably read it too. And and February is the Black History Month here for all of us who are in the U.S. So, yeah, it's, it's being able to channel that the anger that we feel, right, in in some sort of medium or expression. So, I think there is another question in the Q and I think it was left earlier around the time when Edna was uh, reciting. So I, I, I assume it was for Edna. Uh, which language were these poems originally written in? So I, I guess this is a question mainly maybe interested in the linguistic kind of, you know, fluidity of the poems that you're all citing. And I think Mandy touched on the linguistic fluency a little bit. So do you want to speak to that, Edna? Um, sure. Uh, for me, I think, um, English has always been like more comfortable for me to express myself in writing um, just because I also read a lot in English uh, mainly. Uh, so I think uh, when I write, that's what I default to. So a lot of the lines and stanzas and you know everything originate in English, but there are like, especially with the poems that I read, which were written after um, everything was going on in Burma and like, that are more directly um, associated with the revolution, those lines um, come to me almost sim simultaneously. Sometimes some parts will come in Burmese, sometimes it'll come in English. And then I just try to make sure that when I'm translating, I'm just trying to like <laughs> keep the integrity of both 
because if I really wrote it the way it came to me in my head, it would just be like a mishmash of every language, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't really have rhyme or reason. It just appears to me usually like when I, um, like wake up from bed, <laughs> like they know the example, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's so true. Yeah, they you know the example. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I would be interested in hearing uh, Mika and Mandy kind of talk about their process too. I'm interested in it. Yes, please. Yeah, um, for me, I uh, I'm more comfortable with Burmese, especially when it comes to uh, poetry, because I have um, a lot more sort of, I have more experience with it. I have more, um, you know, um, like techniques to work with. So I usually uh, write mine in Burmese first um, and then translate it to uh, English. And I think which you can kind of hear it in my English poems because the English versions are a little bit more tricky. And, and especially the first two poems that I read um, were written in Burmese first. So, and they were also a lot harder to translate because of, um, you know, a lot of the Burmese uh, poetry references that I made, the cultural and technical uh, poetry references that I make. Uh, but the, the last one is uh, the Gazal was written in English first. So this is one of my few poems that, um, that I write first in English and then sort of um, translated in, in Burmese. Uh, so which is also why I also read the English version first and then uh, ended with Burmese. But still, um, when I was translating um, that one, it, it was a lot easier for me to translate it into, into Burmese. And also, even when you read it, it almost feels like I wrote the Burmese one first because of how much kind of stronger uh, it is when you, uh, when you hear it. So uh, that's kind of what my process is like generally. But I hope uh, you could hear, like when I was reading the Burmese one, I hope you could hear like some of the, um, like the rhymes and like um, the kind of the word place that I was doing, uh, even, even if you don't have sort of the language um, uh, understanding, yeah. Yes, yes, thank you Edna and Mimi um, for sharing that, yes. I mean, also Burmese is my first language, so I really enjoy like, U2 and U3, or oh, I, I guess U2, <laughs> side and reciting in Burmese too, because it's also really like, you know, like the, the speaking in, in quote unquote mother tongue, right, also makes you sometimes feel like at home. So that's what it makes me feel. Um, um, I just wanted to add something really quick too, because um, I think I just started writing poetry in Burmese like this year. Um, and it's, I, I, I think when I, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I just lost, you know, <laughs> but um, I grew up in Yango. I went to uh, Burmese schools so of Burmese, you know, is my first language too, but I always kind of associate it with school and like, you know, since it's a government school, we had the government curriculum, which is like, you know, <laughs> just very um, problematic to say the least. Um, but so in my head, because I was reading um, English books that were also accessible to me for fun, um, English has always felt more like it, it seems counterintuitive, but it almost seemed more liberating to write in English um, in that sense. But since I've been writing in Burmese more, it's also felt so liberating to reconnect uh, with my mother tongue in a more expressive way, I think. Yes, yes, definitely. And and I've enjoyed working with Edna on the, the, the language and everything. So yes, it's really great. Uh, we have a really good question in the chat and, and maybe all three of you could kind of uh, give an answer because I think it's a really great question. And although we're kind of pressed on time, uh, what did writing from each of your perspectives do what did, sorry, what did writing from each of your perspectives do for you as an artist, activist, citizen, and person? I think that's a really great question. Yeah, um, I can jump in. That is a, a really great question. Um, I think, um, 
I'm not sure if, if uh, let me know if I'm not understanding the question. Uh, but I think for me, the writing, like one after the coup, um, you know, attempt happened and I started writing like almost immediately um, was, you know, I, I usually just write online and then um, like share it, um, share my writing online. And for, for a lot, from a lot of people, I hear back that some, a lot of the writings uh, that I've been doing was sort of, um, you know, there are a lot of people who felt the same way, who just, you know, didn't have, um, you know, the experience to express, but then whenever they, they, they hear the words, it just make them feel that they're not alone. And I think for me, that sort of community, like me being able to just kind of connect with my friends through the writings and reconnect with my community. I think that's the sort of uh, the main thing that it did, like the, the writing did, um, like after these pieces, especially after the coup did for me. And I think, I think it's like, usually it's all about, I mean, I talk about this before too, like connecting with that community, being a, keeping in touch with that and keeping it as an integral part of my life is something that um, just happened. But I, I think the last one, um, the, the fuck mill piece, I think that one that did get a little bit of traction. I, uh, so I think it's, you know, um, it has a problems of resistance as well, uh, being expressed in anger, directing that towards, um, you know, the entity that is the, at the core of the oppression, I think it's really important. Um, and I know like there are a lot of uh, military supporter and then like the communities, um, you know, especially the, the military side um, got quite rage to it after seeing the videos um, online. So I think that resistance actually, you know, I think it's a powerful form of resistance. And I think that's um, uh, another um, purpose that the writing does for me. And so that's plays like sort of uh, the, um, the act of activism as well in that sense. Um, and I think the last, um, just lost my train of thought. Um, I think the last thing is also just, I mean, a process and feeding is also one part, right? And connecting uh, with each other through like this, um, I think it's also another thing that um, definitely did it for me. Yeah, I think especially, I'm very, especially like in the face of the coup and this uh, revolution, I'm very aware of my own specificity, like I said in my introduction to my reading, it's um, all of these poems are born out of sort of my own sort of experience and the way that I view the world, which is deaf, it's just real specific. There is no universality, um, like I tell my students. <laughs> but I do think because on another level to Recognizing that specificity allows me to be better able to view others in their own specificities. So even though, you know, we are speaking in terms of a collective, like Myanmar as a whole, although, you know, there's a lot of different components to that whole, um, we are sort of fighting for a common cause. It's, I think the writing has helped me just sort of recognize that there are so many other different voices, everyone speaking out of their own sort of specificities, but also thinking about it on a representational level, right? Because there's Burmese poetry that is just, it was starting to, you know, not spread, but like, but spread across the world. And so people were starting to know Burmese poets, starting to read Burmese poetry, but just on a base level, there's just not a lot of it out there and so yeah this I think that just comes back to community and just making certain that we're all working together and a little salad bowl of perspectives yeah and I I just remember my the last train of thought that I had 
Um, and I think another thing is also driving the conversations. Uh, I think there are a lot of important conversations to be have as part of the resistance. Like how do we bring different communities together, especially the communities that have been traditionally oppressed and you know, including like the Rohingya uh, communities like uh, uh, Machu has already mentioned the uh, sort of the recognition of Rohingya poetry as well. And I think those are also really important in driving that like where does the Burmese language as a language play in terms of colonializing a lot of the ethnic uh, languages and erasing a lot of the cultures. I think those are the, the conversations that uh, we as poets can sort of drive as well. And I know uh, Mandy does really well with positioning herself in like a diaspora artist and, you know, like expressing how the identity of a lot of diaspora, Burmese, um, you say Burmese American, Burmese ex, um, it was a really great poem with my uh, Mandy as well. So I think those are also really important conversation. And that's also something that I like hope to do with my writing, um, you know, being aware of those conversations and bringing uh, those conversations forward. Yeah, um, I agree with everything <laughs> Mika and Mandy have been saying. Um, and that's how I feel too. Uh, but I also want to add that on, a, on, on like a personal level, right? When I write poetry, it's usually to process and to heal, um, as well as a way to preserve joy and um, to look into the future and like to be able to imagine a better future that isn't rooted in the current systems that are currently in place. Um, so I think like, you know, I when we write like research papers, whatever, there's like I feel like there's like a certain form that needs to be, you know, adhered to certain references that are allowed. Uh, and I feel like poetry just, you know, lets everything out and you're like, you just can imagine whatever you want. You can write whatever you want. You can like, you know, we, in, in some of my poetry, um, I talk about like solidarity, abolition, demilitarization, like all these concepts that, I just want to like get rid of and then start over. I can do that in poetry, right? Um, and so that's been a really powerful tool for me um, to kind of work through these feelings and these ideas that I have and make it something that I can actually look forward to and that I can take action on. And the process of writing poetry really, um, I don't know, hits the spot for me, you know? <laughs> um, and, and then I mentioned earlier also that um, poetry to me also means community um, and sharing these like ideas with people that me, me and Mandy were saying also like, um, you know, we deserve to tell our stories uh, in our own specificities, like Mandy was saying, like, you know, just because uh, we're in the diaspora doesn't mean um, we just stop existing in either side, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think finding that community has been really helpful, like, yeah. Also, thank you, Dr. King, for asking the question and for coming. Love you. Thank you. Yes, thank you to all the amazing comments in the comments session, to, to all the poets. That's really encouraging and having this kind of positive space for us to be in, although some of us are reciting the poems of, you know, mourning and like, grief um but we still need to also celebrate our like moments of joys and pleasures so yeah it's been really great and um thank you to all the poets and all the people who have been here to this to this uh to the end of the event and i want to we are also kind of pressed for time now and i want to kind of conclude you know, today's event with uh, one of the poems that i wrote although yes i don't call myself a poet and uh in celebration of all the poets here today, you know, the, and the new and emerging generation of not just poets, but also knowledge producers in their own right and in the way that they, whatever the language that they want to use to express that and whatever uh, kind of uh, positionality and specificity that they want to speak from. So I want to celebrate to all of those poets, either in the diaspora or in back in Myanmar or, you know, in any other places in the world. So. ปิ่นบัวละอยุคลุ่ดไตปี้ตรีเรอะคะนุ่นเปียยะมาเลอยุอะพูอนุเนมหมอกะคะโกมีมาไซยีลองยินสุตองนอกตะพันจาปิ่
So that was in Bamis, and I translated uh, into English as well. Propagated. Glashing hands, black off a branch, gentle, soft, and young. How can I throw it away? So I stick it in the soil and pray for a while. In a little while, I check again. The branch is weak, yet still holding up. Once and twice more, the branch will be propagated, not as a copy stem, but as a new true life, dedicated to Myanmar's Generation Z and to our futures. 3262021. Yes, so with that, um, I will, I guess, invite back Julie in case uh, Julie want to, uh, or should I just conclude the event? Uh, I'm not sure. Yes, Julie, please go ahead. We can, we can conclude the event. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you everyone for coming. And yes, um, I guess you, you will, we'll have a recording, I guess. So yeah, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> Julie, if you want to add anything else. Like yeah, this. no, thank you so much to all of you. This was such a beautiful event. I'm just so moved and I learned so much. And so, yeah, thanks to all of you. And thanks to everyone who attended. Um, yeah. Have a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.